Now we have a five-minute talk on a probabilistic programming language for switching common filters. Five. Yeah. Ten minutes. Oh, it says five here, but I will, I will, I will time it for ten minutes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Uh, so this is the last talk of the day. Uh, it's going to cover kind of similar stuff, of course, because it's also about probabilistic programming language. Um, so I work for a company where we analyze a lot of time series data, and we're using um, hidden um, hidden state models to do that. So here's a very simple hidden state model. Uh, suppose that you're in a biology lab and you've got um, a cell culture which has initially 100 cells plus or minus. So X is the number of cells. And uh, you're, we're going to assume that the number of cells doubles every day. Um, so of course, we're going to get exponential growth in the number of cells. And um, if there's no measurement, then the uncertainty is going to uh, grow exponentially as well. Now, uh, when we add a single measurement, uh, just to show what it looks like, um, we're going to have a grad student on the fourth day count the number of cells. And then he says that there's uh, 2,000 cells plus or minus 100 um, on that day. And so uh, we added a line to our model here to, uh, to account for that. And um, after the measurement, of course, our uncertainty is going to be much, uh, much lower, uh, which is the posterior probability distribution using Bayes' rule, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, that information also propagates backward in time. So if there were 2,000 cells on the fourth day and the number of cells doubles every day, then logically there were half as many cells on the day before. And so uh, you get a graph like this. Um, all of these uh, inferences could have been done using markup chain Monte Carlo, using Turing or Gen, but uh, it turns out that when, there's, uh, when the model dynamics are, are linear and when all the uncertainties are Gaussian, then uh, there's a much faster algorithm available called the common filter. And it's, uh, it's not based on sampling, it just computes the exact posterior using uh, linear algebra manipulations. Uh, to give an idea, like in our, um, for our data and our models and like real, real world data, we're able to process uh, 10 million uh, observations per second on a single thread um, and, all, and this yields a posterior on 20 million unknowns, um, yeah, in one second. Um, so just to be clear, like whenever I've got these models over here, you've got, you see the plus and minus signs here. Um, it's always uh, referring to the, uh, the standard deviation of a Gaussian uncertainty. Uh, now, at R2, uh, we're working on uh, chlorine production systems. So this is a, a chlorine production plant from the inside. From the outside, it looks like a refinery. And um, inside of this room, there's about 1,000 uh, electrolysis cells. So each of these cells is connected with one of these uh, white um, tubes that you see. And uh, one of the big concerns for these plants is um, energy uh, consumption. So it's it's hugely energy intensive. And um, it turns out that like, as, the, um, as time goes on, the cells uh, tend to degrade. Like some parts of the cells tend to degrade and they become more um, energy hungry. Their energy consumption increases. And so um, one of the questions that the plant managers have is, uh, okay, I've got a thousand cells. Uh, some of them are worse, like which one should I replace uh, first? Obviously, it's going to be the one that is the most uh, energy hungry. But unfortunately, there's no, um, there's no direct way of measuring the energy consumption of individual cells. The only thing we measure per cell is the voltage. And from the voltage with common filters and a model, we're able to uh, infer the, um, the energy consumption of each cell. Uh, now, the energy consumption is actually like split along two axes. So there's like two metrics for energy consumption. I'm not going to explain why. Um, but um, so in other words, our hidden state in this case is uh, two numbers, okay? The two components of uh, energy consumption. And in this, in this uh, animation here, I'm showing one year, of, uh, one year of data for a single cell. And uh, in the lower right, it's the uh, posterior uncertainty uh, distribution, which is being updated as each new data point uh, comes in. Um, so yeah, this is for just one cell. I'm going to, uh, we can do the exercise for all the cells in one electrolyzer. 
and uh, you get uh, you get a plot like this. Okay, so um, there's these uh, here. I'm just showing the posterior mean um, of each cell as it's uh, as the year uh, as the year's data goes on, and um, what you can see is well. What I wish we could see would be that, like, most of the cells would be moving towards the top right because, uh, you know, their energy consumption is, is getting worse and worse and worse, which is what I, I was uh, telling you about. So it's not quite moving towards the top right. It's more like moving towards the top left. Um, so that's a modeling deficiency, which I'm going to talk a bit uh, uh, about later. Um, but what you can see, uh, which is working nicely, is that uh, whenever uh, I told you that plant managers replace some cells uh, with newer cells that have lower energy consumption, and you can clearly see uh, those things whenever, like, uh, you know, like here, there's a bunch of cells that move towards the lower right. Uh, that's uh, exactly because their, uh, their energy consumption went down because they were replaced by uh, newer cells. So um, I want to talk about one last uh, toy example, um, which is uh, which is about uh, switching common filters. So suppose you've got uh, you've got a tank, uh, a water tank, uh, which is connected to a pump, and uh, the pump is is really lousy, uh, but it's it's pumping water continuously into uh, into the tank, and uh, the water level, uh, the true water level inside of the of the tank is increasing at a rate of uh, one liter per minute, plus or one min plus or minus one liter. So it's a very variable increase. And, um, and there's also uh, pump failures that can happen. So once about, uh, once about every two hours, uh, more or less, um, the pump is going to fail. And uh, you need to call Bob to go and kick it so that it starts working again. Um, and we'd like to detect that, but there's no direct sensor on the pump. So the pump failure is part of the hidden state. So initially, um, initially the water level is, uh, is zero, so the tank is empty. Uh, the pump failure is false because the pump is working, but um, yeah, eventually the pump failure can become true. Um, and um, because this is a discrete variable which is part of the hidden state, uh, you can't deal with it with uh, straight common filters because they only deal with continuous uh, Gaussian Gaussianly distributed variables. Uh, so what you need to do, or one of the algorithms for doing this, is that uh, you're going to maintain multiple hypothesis, okay, multiple filters in parallel corresponding to the different um, state of these, uh, of these variables, uh, of the discrete variables. So, uh, so one of the hypotheses is going to be there has been no pump failures and there is no pump failure now. Uh, second hypothesis will be that there was a pump failure at one minute past midnight and then, you, you know, pump failure at two minutes past midnight, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have a very large number of hypotheses um, that you have to contend with and it's a computational challenge. But uh, leaving that aside, um, the, the behavior can be really nice because you can um, just from, like in this example, the only thing that we're going to measure is the, the water level, which also has some uncertainty of, uh, plus, of plus or minus five liters. And um, from that, uh, I, in the next plot, I'm going to show you uh, the, so the way, the way that the, the hypothesis switching works is that you've got your top hypothesis, and this is what I'm going to show you, and at some point, it switches to another hypothesis which better explains the data. Um, so here in blue, we've got the, the inference according to the leaning hypothesis, and in orange, uh, there's the data points, okay? So initially, uh, the pump is working well, so, uh, and the, the leading hypothesis is fitting the data perfectly, but at some point, uh, you know, the measurements are like not looking so uh, good according to the leading hypothesis, and uh, eventually it switches to another hypothesis which better explains the data, which is simply that, hey, there was a pump failure at 20 minutes past midnight. So uh, from a data science perspective, this is interesting because uh, not only do we get to, um, to look at, uh, not only does it detect that there, was a pump, that there is a pump failure now, but it also, uh, we can present a coherent narrative to our customers. We can say like, hey, this and this and this happened uh, in the last hour, and this is, wh this is why you're seeing the data that you've seen. Um, so this is going to be my last slide, uh, comment filters for data science. Um, for the kind of stuff that we do, it's, it's really 
Uh, it feels really good or compelling because uh, in industrial data processing, these are very well understood processes. You know, it's not like biology where everything is like chaotic all the time. Uh, so I can sit down with an expert and uh, get um, and get him to write uh, this model with me. Um, the uh, linearity assumption uh, is not so bad because a lot of times you can, uh, so the model only has to be linear in the state variables. Um, so, the, so for instance, in the biology example, you could have that the growth rate, uh, it's, uh, it's not just two, you know, doubling every day, rather the growth rate is a function of the room temperature, it can be a function of the, the CO2 level in the room, and, um, and that function, it can be either specified by an expert or it can be learned with automatic differentiation and, um, and all of these things, uh, like automatic differentiation, deep learning, uh, maximum likelihood, et cetera. Um, and my last, my last comment is that, like, for us specifically, uh, one of the big weaknesses of this model is that um, it's making the assumption that um, each error is, each measurement error is independent and identically distributed, uh, which is a bit like saying that uh, if I've got a thermometer, which, like, is uncertain plus or minus one degree Celsius, then I can reduce uh, the uncertainty uh, by averaging lots of, I can look at the, at the thermometer multiple times and average those numbers, and then somehow I'm going to get a better uh, measurement of the temperature inside the room. But this is clearly um, this is clearly not the case. So there's solutions about it, but or ways around this. But uh, I guess I'm out of time. So um, thank you very much. And if you're interested in this kind of problem and you live in Canada, then um, we're hiring. <laughs> thank you. Thank you a lot, and thank you, audience. <laughs>